Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Around the turn of 1606, a group of London theatre-goers braved the plague to take in a new play by the well-known impresario Mr William Shakespeare. Packed into the Globe Theatre, they were treated to a tale of violence, hatred and betrayal so upsetting that it languished among Shakespeare's less popular plays until rewritten about six years later with a happy ending. The play was King Lear, a drama on the folly of age, the cruelty of families and the futility of ambition in the wilderness of ancient Britain, a place where, as the Duke of Albany declares in the play... Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. But why did Shakespeare take a story from the deep history of Britain and make it so shockingly his own when, from the Civil War to the Second World War, and when did this powerful and confusing tragedy emerge to be thought of as Shakespeare's greatest? With me to discuss King Lear are Jonathan Bate, Professor of English Literature at the University of Warwick, Catherine Duncan-Jones, Fellow in English at Somerville College, Oxford, and Catherine Balsey, Research Professor in English at the University of Wales, Swansea. Jonathan Bate, King Lear was first performed on Boxing Day uh, for King James I. Can you give us a sense of the opening scene of the play and how it would have played in front of James, uh, the new king, relatively new king? Yeah, that's right. The first performance we know about was the the court performance in front of King James and all his court um, in the banqueting hall in Whitehall Palace, Boxing Day 1606. Now, this is very early in King James's reign. Um, You know, Shakespeare's earlier plays have been written when Queen Elizabeth is, is Queen of England and Scotland's a separate country, King James, King of Scotland. 1603, James, after Elizabeth's death, becomes king of both England and Scotland. And he begins to think about the idea of Britain, the idea of uniting not just for thrones, but the states of England and Britain. So along come the King's Men, Shakespeare's acting company, and perform a play set in ancient Britain. And it begins with the King coming on and saying, I'm getting old, I'm 81 years old, I'm tired, I'm going to retire, but I I haven't got a son to inherit my kingdom. I've only got three daughters, so I'll divide my kingdom the Kingdom of Britain, into three. Say, he says to his daughters, which of you doth love us most? Whichever of you loves us most will get the best bit of the kingdom. So the two older daughters, Goneril and Regan, give very fulsome speeches about how much they love him. I love him, says Goneril, more than word can wield the matter. And so he gives them a good portion of, of the kingdom. And then Cordelia, the third, the youngest daughter, the most loved, the only one as yet unmarried, she can't think of anything to say. She says nothing. And King Lear's furious. He banishes her. He divides up the kingdom between the other two, Goneril and Regan, and the tragedy begins from that point. Well, she does say something. She says she loves him according to her bond, no more nor less, and she criticises her sisters for saying they love him all. She says, how can you love your husbands? She says it better than this, of course. <laughs> how can you love your husbands uh, if, if you love your father all? So she does say something. Yeah, what, what she seems to be doing is, is criticising... But he thinks it's nothing, and he says nothing will come of nothing. The nothingness starts with him, doesn't it? That's, that's right. I mean, she, she, she refuses to play the court game of mm. speaking effusive, flattering language. And in a way, she, she's almost sort of over-literal. He says, quantify your love for me. And she says, OK, well, you can have 50%, and my husband, when I marry, can have the other 50%. How can my sisters, who are married, give you all their love when they have husbands? So, and he causes a darker purpose. That's interesting, isn't he? Why he sends the herald away to bring in the, the courtiers, the, sorry, the two kings who are courting Cordelia. He says, now to my our darker purpose. So he's breaking up Britain. And as you say, he's James VI of Scotland, which is a very different country from England, of which is now James I. Wales has been, as it were, absorbed in the 50... Uh, nearly 100 years ago. Ireland has been conquered. So he wants it to be a Great Britain. And what he sees... Is, is a man slicing up Great Britain. What, in that sense, do you think that Shakespeare was writing to the condition of the king's thoughts? I think he, I think he must have been. He must have known that James had this, this project of uniting the kingdoms, but the parliaments in both London and Edinburgh were very resistant to this. So the idea of going back to the old chronicles of ancient Britain and writing a play about the dire consequences of dividing the kingdom clearly would play to James's interests. 
What's more, there in the audience were James's two sons, Prince Henry and Prince Charles, Charles who, who, who would eventually become Charles I, Prince Henry, who would die. Um, like most royals and aristocrats, uh, th those princes had a string of titles. Among their titles were the Duke of Albany and the Duke of Cornwall. So, uh, and th those were the names of the husbands of Goneril and Regan, the older sisters. And Cornwall is clearly representative of the Celtic West, of sort of Wales and, and the West Country. Albany was an old name for Scotland. So there's a sense that the three kingdoms are there. Lear's plan is that Cordelia will inherit England, the richest prize, but that, um, because of, of her, her refusal to play the game, that doesn't happen. Finally, before we leave this part of it, the James, the first and sixth, seems to have been uh, very, very um, ad admiring of Shakespeare. He, he, they were the king's men. He wanted them here. He wanted to see the plays. He, 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 and he clearly seems to have got involved in this. He, and also in Macbeth, were that was a different program, um, and so we're talking about something that is happening in the court, about the court, and made for the court. Yeah, I mean, very one of the first things that happens with, with, within six weeks of um, of James taking the crown is that Shakespeare's company, who had been called the Lord Chamberlain's men, m meaning their patron was the Lord Chamberlain, who was in charge of all court performances, they were renamed, given a patent to become the King's men. Now we don't know how closely James himself was involved with it. Because I think what probably was happening was there were a group of courtiers um, who were very close to Shakespeare um, and were also sort of jostling for, for position to get the patronage of King James. Um, uh, the, the, the two brothers, the Earl of Pembroke and the Earl of Montgomery, were, were crucial figures here. So I think in a way... The, it, it, it's to do with one group of courtiers wanting their players to be the king's men. Another group of courtiers got their players to be the queen's men. But there's no doubt that in those early p p plays of the early part of King James's reign, such as Lear and Macbeth and Measure for Measure, Shakespeare is absolutely writing to the interests of King James, who was a great intellectual king. Indeed. Catherine Duncan-Jones, can we take the story, just before I ask another question through from where Jonathan left off, the kingdom has been divided into three. Cordelia has not um, gone overboard in her love for her father, but although it proves she is the one who loves him most as the play goes on, um, and he, in effect, banishes her. She's taken without dower. She herself is a dower by the king of uh, France, and, and away she goes uh, for, a, for a quite a duration. Can you just take us to towards the end of the play briefly, what the main things that happen? Yes, well, we've already um, established that a, a big theme throughout the play is um, parents and children and love, uh, love in deed and love in word. Uh, Goneril and Regan say they love their father in words, but very rapidly, from on from what Jonathan has described, it becomes clear they don't love him. Indeed, in fact, they are thoroughly fed up him up with him and find him and his retinue a complete nuisance. And then, in parallel, there is a second plot which has the same theme treated differently. The king's one of the king's leading courtiers, King Lear's leading courtiers, not King James's, the Earl of Gloucester, has two sons one of whom is a bastard um, genetically, that is, he was conceived out of wedlock and he is also a bastard in the modern slang sense of the word and is often a very entertaining and charismatic character in no, the God, theater. stand up for bastards. And yeah. his virtuous brother is a bit sort of null and dull initially, though that doesn't continue. So what happens from then on is there seems to be a plan that Lear alternates residence first with his elder daughter Goneril, then with Regan month by month. It unravels almost at once. Goneril finds Lear and his retinue of a hundred drunken knights and his fool absolutely intolerable in a well-ordered household. Because Lear's given that way, but he, he's kept a hundred knights. He's he, going to move from court to court, month to month between these two courts. And really, yes. he, the, well, his role model in British antiquity, a, a theme in which James was greatly interested, was old King Cole, that merry old soul, who this one didn't have fiddlers three, but knights one hundred. And initially, we may feel a bit sympathetic with Goneril, depending on how the play is staged, that actually a hundred drunken knights, on top of all the servants she has already, and a new marriage and possibly pregnant, um, does make life difficult. But in fact, she is horrible. Lear feels, is rejected by her and feels very rejected <coughs> by her and curses her goes to Regan, who he thinks will be lovely and sweet and let him have exactly what he wants. Regan, as the fool warns him, is even worse. And then finally, both of them, um, Goneril arrives at Regan's castle and they both agree that 
he shall only be cut down from 100 knights to 50, but to 25. It's all this about love and measurement that Jonathan has already mentioned, the idea of love being measured either in words or in numbers. Can we stop with those two sisters? Mm. Because it depends how you read the play, doesn't it? It when, does. When you read Goddard reading and you're turning up... I, this, is, this is me, obviously, with a gun. Obviously, right. You're telling me the hundred knights. They're riotous. They drunk. They won't. They won't listen to what my people tell them to do. There's an awful lot of people. A hundred knights with their squires and their horses and their this and the other. You, uh, there's, there's some of you that think, well, they've got a point here. In some productions, I think one does feel they have a point, but things unfold in such a way that I don't think it's possible to go on thinking Goneril and Regan. That is a wonderful turn that he makes, that you begin to feel sorry for him because of what, uh, even though they, they, they claim... Of I course, mean, he you, they might be lying. That, are they lying? That, you can't tell, can you? Because he says these knights are very civil people, they're w well brought up, they're well bred, so who do we believe? It partly depends how it's staged. Yeah. There was a production, the only production I've seen where one rarely had a sense of the drunken knights and what a real pain in the neck they might be was at the Globe, I think, in 2001 with Julian Glover as Lear, where the drunken knights came in through the groundlings with a tremendous amount of weaponry, very drunk, very booted and big and noisy, crashing their way through these hapless groundlings, including you know, toddlers and pushchairs and so on, rushing onto the stage and being an absolute nuisance. And I thought... Gosh, I wouldn't want them in my house. Um, but actually, even so, as the play developed, it did become clear that, like father, like daughter, Lear is very irascible, very easily inflamed to rage and bitterness, but his daughters are, if anything, worse. They're chips of the worst part of the old block. Catherine Bowser, can you tell us where this story came from, the Lear story? Yes. I, it comes originally from an old folk tale. Uh, could I tell you the story? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I'll very tell you brief, very, very briefly. Moment, yeah. It's a story uh, known as Love Like Salt, in which an old rich father asks his three daughters which one loves him most. This is in Geoffrey de Monmouth. That's uh, we're talking about Geoffrey high middle Monmouth, ages. Yes, uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth appropriates this story mm. and calls the central character King Lear and names the daughters. But we think that his origin was this widely circulated European folk tale. The, the story is, as I, as I began it, uh, that he asks his daughters which loves him most. The first says, more than life itself. And he says, excellent, take some land and a rich husband. The second says, more than all the world. And he says, very good, take some land and a rich husband. And then he turns to the third and she says, I love you as fresh meat loves salt. And he says, that's not good enough. You can do better than that. No, she says, I love you as fresh meat loves salt. He banishes her, disgusted by this feeble response. And she uh, disguises herself and goes down the road to the next household where she becomes a scullion. Naturally, the master of the house falls in love with her, as is guaranteed in folk tales. And at the wedding feast, uh, to which her father is invited, of course, no one knows who the bride is. She's still in disguise. She sends word to the kitchen not to put any salt in the cooking. And the guests, of course, find it disgusting. We have to bear in mind this is the Middle Ages and salt was how you preserved meat. At this point, the father gets the message, understands the mistake he's made and bursts into tears, thinking it's too late. Nothing can be... Not, he, the situation can't be redeemed. But she recognises him comes down from the high table, takes him to join her, and they all live happily ever after. And they did in that story, because there was a Lear going on before, in, in, as it, let us call it, Shakespeare's time, before Shakespeare uh, wrote his Lear, and it ended happily. Now, can you just briskly tell us how Shakespeare changed the ending of the story that he'd inherited? Yes. Because it, that, that changed the play yes. utterly. It's true. It was a very well-known tale in its own time, and... Uh, 
all the versions of it had previously had happy endings. One of the noticeable things is that the first published version of the play in 1608 is called The Chronicle History of King Lear, so that the audience would not necessarily be expecting an unhappy ending. And it certainly seems when Cordelia comes back and restores Lear to sanity as if everything is going to go fine. It doesn't. The um, elder sisters kill themselves in desperation. Uh, Leah is willing to go off to prison with Cordelia, but Cordelia is hanged in prison. He comes back on stage with her in his arms, and I think this is the most unbearable moment for the audience because this is a, like a parody of the embrace he should have given her at the beginning. And he is clearly now senile. The Leah, who's been so fluent, so eloquent, so poetic, is now reduced to a very bare, uh, sparse and austere language of total, total despair. Although another change was in, in, in Shakespeare's version that, that throughout the play, from very near the beginning, he, he was frightened that he would go mad. Uh, don't let me go mad, give me that patience, patience I need. Yeah. Fear of madness. Um, it, it precedes fear of senility. I mean, he is... I, I would have thought those are the two big differences. So there we have the play, there we have the folk tale. Geoffrey of Monmouth in the Middle Ages found it, we think, rather than invented it. It was played a little, then Shakespeare took hold of it and changed it the, the way you've described. Um, what about the, the world, briskly, Jonathan Bate, uh, under Lear? It's uh, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. It's pre-Christian. What governs it, if an outside... It does anything, Governor? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because the, the uh, old King Lear play, the anonymous play that Shakespeare inherited, has a very strong Christian providential structure. At various points, something terrible is going to happen and people appeal to the Christian God and God intervenes and everything's OK. Shakespeare very strikingly strips all that away. He makes it this pagan world. It, in one sense, it it's, imagines a godless world, a world where there is no order, there is nothing there. And then at other times, as you say, there seem to be moments that if there are gods, there are these malicious figures uh, who, who just treat us uh, as, as, as pawns, as toys. And we're governed by weather, we're governed by speculations in astrology, uh, and, and so on and so forth. How shocking, uh, Catherine Barsley, would this have been, this version of King Lear? After all, the, the, the Elizabethan Jacobean audience were used to an awful lot of shocks when they went to, when they went to the London theatres. That's true, and presumably that's what they went for. They liked them. But, but it, this is a brilliant theatrical coup, it seems to me. We, all of us, know that King Lear is a tragedy. Even people who've never seen it and never read it know that it's a tragedy. But the original audience would not necessarily have known that. And I think would have been propelled by the folktale structure to expect that the reconciliation, which takes place after all, would would last. But when that's snatched away, finally, uh, and, and it's done with tremendous suspense because you're not even sure that Cordelia's really dead. Leah thinks maybe she's not. If that her breast, breath will stain this mirror, then she lives. And he dies possibly believing she is still alive, but it's quite clear that he's deluded clear from the reactions of the other characters that he's deluded in that belief. But talking about the audience of the time, Catherine Duncan Jones, um, um, were they shot? I mean, it was always explained that they'd be shocked because they would expect a different sort of leer. They would expect the leer of the sort of almost like Cinderella, two ugly sisters and the nice sister, and away you go at the ending, and that's fine. Um, but would they have been shocked at the thing itself, at a king going mad? at the gouging out of Gloucester's eyes, out vile jelly, at the daughter's turning on the father in such a, in such a vicious way, at, 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 at the Cordelia being hanged uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Would that in itself have shocked outside the actions themselves? I think it would have been extremely shocking and more informed readers, perhaps ones who were familiar with Harrison's description of Britain in Hollinshed that Shakespeare drew on, would be aware that, described as Catherine Belsey has said, as a true chronicle history on the quarto title page and when registered with the stationers it was again called a history, it wasn't called a tragedy Shakespeare wasn't being historically accurate in terms of narrative. He was being historically accurate in terms of ideology as Harrison makes it very clear that in this period Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, religion in Britain was superstition, devil worship, deeply confused mixtures of 
astrological predictions, or muddled version of the Greco-Roman gods, and of course Leo very early on. Um, curses by Apollo, and he curses. He he invokes names of um, Roman gods, and is always almost always checked by Kent for doing so. It's ideologically true, if as a picture of a world in total chaos, um, moral and physical chaos, in which the virtuous characters, who are more surprising in many ways even than the evil ones, are searching for some kind of providential pattern, something redemptive, not finding it. The last example is one example of how they search for it. They don't find it. Albany, in the very few lines from the end, saying, the heavens defend her, having suddenly been reminded that Leo and Cordelia, that the order has been given by Edmund that Cordelia is to be killed, and then she's brought in dead. Yes. I mean, that, as it were, his appeal to the heavens is answered visually. That's, that's what the heavens do for you in this world. And there are confusions and contradictions, violent ones, inside speeches, aren't there? Um, that they will do such things, but then they know not what. Well, and so, and I will have such revenges so on you all. Yes. What they are, yet I, I know not. not. Oh fool, yes. I shall go mad. Yes. And of course, incoherent, brilliantly, richly evocative, but incoherent, muddled speech is one of the features of the play, particularly in its central scenes, which yes, makes it, it brilliant and unlike anything else Shakespeare or anyone else wrote. Yes, Edgar and and the fool, Jonathan. I mean, yeah, what, what, what he's doing there with with Lear's speech breaking down is, he, he he's he's dramatising what it's like. For, for the mind and for language to be under the stress of the worst possible things. You think the worst is happening and then something worse happens still. I mean, in, in many ways, of all Shakespeare's plays, it's the one closest to ancient Greek tragedy. He didn't know Greek tragedy directly, but he certainly knew the Roman tragedian Seneca, uh, who, who inherited all sorts of gouged-out eyes and bloody murders from Greek tragedy. But the shocking thing is that Shakespeare represents those things on stage. In, in Seneca, it's all narrated and off stage. Um, and this word nothing comes in again and again and again. Nothing will come up, nothing. You're a cipher without a number, right through. And the sort of nothingness of, I mean, of existence itself is, is shoots through the play, doesn't it? Catherine Barsley. I think it does, but, but it seems to me that that's possibly under the pressure of what happens within this family. Uh, one of the things that comes across in this play and makes it still powerful in our own time is the way it demonstrates that the family is the place of the most intense emotions, of demands for love and, and of love itself, but also of the most passionate hatreds and cruelty, psychological cruelty, almost beyond any other possibility. Once the, those family intensities are muddled up with the question of property once what's at stake is land which is why the sisters lie to him because they want land it's why Edmund cheats Edmund his the father bastard. Edmund the bastard yeah. cheats his father he says legitimate Edgar I must have your land that's what the motive is and the so names are names of lands aren't they Cornwall and Kent and Gloucester all of land them. names exactly yeah. exactly so what's at stake is quite clearly possessions. And if you conflate the intensities within the family with the intensity of the desire for land and the power that goes with it, then I think you see very clearly how a kind of nothingness invades this space of the family and is unbearable. One thing that's interesting in the switch from what he inherited and what he did was the ending, but uh, with, that's the most significant thing. But the beginning is also uh, quite fascinating because, uh, in the, as I understand it, in the story inherited, uh, it, Leah's wife had died, he was full of grief, it was time to give it. None of that. We get none of that in Shakespeare. He comes on, he has a darker purpose, and that's it. His motivation is never discussed. Uh, he wants to go unburthened. Uh, but that, I think that is the motivelessness of it. gives it a, And the device of the beginning. Can you talk a bit more of that, Catherine Duncan Jones? Yes, there's a lot that isn't explained. And, uh, um, of course, you're absolutely right. The old play actually opens with Queen Lear's queen having just died and Lear rather sensibly knowing he's an old man thinking now his wife is dead, his daughter's time, his daughters were married off and he doesn't have to worry about them because being their father, not their mother, he's not really so good at guiding them. All of that is excluded. There is so much we are not told and if we are reading or studying the play as so many school children and students are, we ask these awkward questions. Who was their mother? If where three children and two are very different from the other one, then we might think, well, did Leo marry twice? 
was Cordelia perhaps? The tra- but I mean, we, the play doesn't, particularly as performed, doesn't permit us to ask such questions. It takes us straight into an unexplained situation, which you- is a mystery to some extent, even to Lear's immediate court- courtiers and counsellors. Earlier you mentioned the fool who accompanies Lear until, for a considerable part of the play, Captain Duncan Jones, and um, he he isn't the fool in the sense of performing tricks and, and saying silly things, and, but all, no, he says witty things, but he does go into language which is very, very hard to follow. Not as hard as Edgar, but uh, Edgar on the Heath, who, who, who decides to disguise himself by becoming a, a beggar, let us say, a, a naked beggar roaming the Heath. Um, but he is, he is an... Uh, he is an uh, extraordinarily important and compelling character, The Fool. Can you say a few words about The Fool and where he stands in this play? Yes, The Fool is is of several blunt truth-tellers. Kent is the other great blunt truth-teller. The Fool is the bluntest Kent is a c- truth-teller. Courtier. Kent is the courtier who is banished and then disguises or himself. Or telling the truth. Or saying to Leah, you must not banish your daughter, you're a fool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. And yeah. The Fool tells the truth through riddles and rhymes and teases. And one of the things that he almost never is, is funny. He has a lot of lines and he's on stage a great deal until he just disappears after Lear is persuaded to go into a hovel and 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 have some sleep after he's been raging on the heath. We never see the fool again and we have to assume that the fool who's been complaining of being terribly cold just dies of hypothermia because he vanishes. But in the scenes in which he figures, he is a very, very prominent and key figure in terms of alerting us to certain themes to do with folly and love, um, love, misunderstood love, Lear's actual love for the fool who becomes a kind of surrogate child who's alienated boy. from his three children, but this boy who calls yeah. him Nuncle. Yeah. It's as if he's banished his physical children, but sometimes the fool, and I like it done that way, is quite small and childlike and even sits on Lear's lap. And it's as if unconsciously he's banished the children he couldn't control, and now he has the chi- this childlike figure whom he can slightly more control, but actually is also a truth teller. I, I love the idea of him as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a child because the, the, the core of this play is that as Lear's family and his court collapses, he goes out on, onto this, this, this heath in a storm, and there he develops this, he, he finds this sort of alternative family, the fool. Edgar, who's also been exiled by his father and is now disguising himself as a, as a, as a mad beggar on the run from Bedlam. And then a, along comes Gloucester, and he's been thrown out of um, his, 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 his lands by, by Goneril and Regan. So and it, it, it is like this sort of alternative family, but there's none of the, um, the ritual and the finery of the court. They're all stripped naked, and there's this extraordinary scene where Lear confronts Edgar as poor Tom dressed in nothing but a loincloth and says thou art the thing itself unaccommodated man is such a bare forked thing as thou art it's absolutely and he stripping. rips his own clothes and he off, rips his own clothes off to join him. and then he, he stays in the storm and starts thinking about the poor exposing himself to feel what wretches feel I mean for, for a king to go on that journey it's quite quite extraordinary Catherine Mosley, as you we mentioned and, you, and you, you discussed the story was originally what we could call a folk tale um, and there's still obviously an, a lot of that in, in, in Shakespeare's Lear. Is it instructive to remember that in approaching the characters in this play? I think it would be extremely helpful. One of the things that worries people is exactly that opening scene. Why do they all do what they do? Why does Lear divide up the kingdom? Why doesn't Cordelia just be a bit nicer to him? Why doesn't she just give him what he wants to hear? But I think if you remember the folktale structure, then... W- Those are not the questions we need to ask. Uh, The ritualistic nature of that first scene is very striking. And in the recent Trevenant production with Ian McKellen, they brought out, uh, Trevenant beautifully brought that out by having a lectern. And the three daughters were required in sequence to go and stand behind the lectern and make their their speeches. the text ritualises the proceedings by having Lear say, Goneril, our eldest born, speak first, and then she has to make her speech. Regan again. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I, I take that at the opening, and we've discussed that a little. I was just thinking more of... There's a st- sometimes when you're reading it, you think um, every, every speech almost is... is is connected with everything else, but there isn't the usual sort of run of psychology. It's almost like everyone does a set piece, um, which has connect. I mean, the the fool we've been talking about, he does set pieces, very hard to penetrate. Some Edmund begins. The Edmund the bastard, who's 
uh, is in the tradition of Iago, and so, and he, he he comes on with a set piece, and then does set piece. Lear's rages uh, are set pieces, which go, which d- don't add to the plot; they add to the tone, the intensity. Is there something in that coming out of folk which 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 is is not in other plays? I think I think very much that the notion of the type. The mm. generic type uh, in in folk tale, there are villains and there are good people, and that's about all we know about them. There are daughters and fathers, and that's all we need to know about them. And what I think uh, Shakespeare's play does is to exploit that possibility, so that what we're looking at is not individual characters in the modern sense or in the Victorian sense of that term, but generalized figures of the king who goes mad, the daughter who betrays. But what Shakespeare does so brilliantly is he he subverts the types, he undoes the expectations. So to begin with, Edmund is the bastard and behaves like a bastard. But by the end of the play, both Goneril and Regan, the two queens, have fallen in love with him. And for a moment, it almost looks as if he might become king. And he finally, at the end, um, he tries to get Cordelia saved having ordered her murder, but it's too late. And he dies on the word, yet Edmund was beloved. And you suddenly think, all this bad behaviour is because he's been treated so badly by his father. That sense of, of humanising the, the villainous type is, is, is fantastic. Catherine Duncan Yes, there's a tremendous amount of the unexpected, uh, and what you were saying a moment ago, Milvin, about the sort of speechifying of the characters in those key scenes on the heath. These extraordinary multivocal scenes in which... Um, Edgar, as poor Tom, is talking about animals and eating frog spawn and newts and committing crimes and living in ditches and drinking ditch water. Uh, Leo is ranting on about the only problem in the world being his daughters, his cruel daughters and his sons-in-law and the cruelty of the elements. Um, The fool is coming out with his extraordinary and increasingly pathetic and yet always meaningful patter, rhyming and riddling. Kent occasionally says something that's more commonsensical, but there's no dialogue, it's just all these voices. Mm, mm. And then the unexpected goes right on through the play, where, as I see it in the final act, when we have things that would normally seem in other history plays by Shakespeare, for instance, rather interesting and important, like a French, a French troops arriving in England, or a rather charismatic, though very unpleasant young man carrying on a double love affair, seems as if these things are fighting for our attention. We're not interested. Lear's not interested. We only want to know what's happening to Lear and Cordelia. Lear hasn't learned much. All he has learned is he, he loved, Cordelia loves him. He loves Cordelia. That's what matters. And there's this curious thing. There's so much going on. And as an audience, I think we're excited by but we don't really want all that it's a sort of force of language i, I would suggest mm. i mean i hesitate in front of you three but it's just the force and the intensity of the language drives you through and if you say well why did that happen after that you think well well it did and away it goes again and it, the, the links aren't and aren't need, don't need to be made in that sense it seems to me uh, is most radical and the, the development of the language from this very formal court language to, to the incredible sort of simplicity of you know, Lear's closing speeches where he says, you know, thou'll come no more, never, 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 never. You know, to make a, a, a verse line, an iambic pentameter line out of repeating the word never five times, it's astonishing. Yes, that and going via the storm scene that Catherine described so well just now, where these three voices are interacting with snippets of madness and snippets of relevance to the current situation so that you never know quite which is which. I think it's like a a modernist poem. I I think the wasteland would be the nearest thing there is to the storm scene in its allusion to all sorts of bits and pieces of culture, the Bible, Harsnet and so on. Uh, it, It collects up the culture in order to make a poem which does and doesn't make sense at the same time. How was the play received? There's James sitting there, and uh, there you go. How was it received? Yeah, it's one of the the, the great gaps in our in, in our knowledge is unfortunately we don't have um, you know the the equivalent of um, theatre reviewers we we don't have um, people noting in their journals how King James reacted so it we we really can only speculate on that. Um, I mean, you Shakespeare didn't get sent to the tower. Didn't Shakespeare it, so. didn't get sent to the tower, which, considering uh, you know how uh, extraordinarily how bold the play did, is yeah. with the Mad King, is, but it is notable that in the next few plays that he writes, the next few years, he turns back to that mode of romance 
to to uh, I mean it's, it's plays like the Winter's Tale that he goes on to write and Cymbeline is another ancient British play playing to King James's interest but with a kind of a, a lighter more romantic ending so that might suggest that uh, he he did push it too far and th- and that it wasn't frequently revived. But it was received as a play in terms of uh, 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 of its ongoing uh, performance, one assumes, very well. Uh, um, Catherine Duncan-Jones, as you pointed out when you came in making this programme dangerously topical, that this was the 300th anniversary of the 1608 Quarto um, version which came well, out, which yes. y- y- you say in some, in some passages you prefer to the, to the folio. So it was, if it was produced that quickly, it was therefore popular enough for people to want to do it again and so on. So we have a feeling that it kept being played. And it was even performed by touring players. I mean, we have a record of it was performed in Yorkshire, for instance, using the printed text, and records of touring performances with actual titles of plays are so rare, we should conjecture that it was... It enjoyed quite a lot of repeat performances, particularly once it had reached print, so it was easy to get hold of a text of it. Even if you were not the King's Men, you could get hold of a text to act ra- it from. But rather unusually, I think, you tell me, please, you will mm. tell me if I'm wrong, of course you will. It, some things in the quarto were, you think, are better than the folio, which is m- more often than not not of the case. I think, f- well, just to give one but very important example, Leah's death, um, Catherine Belsey was saying perhaps he dies of joy. I have him, the quarto has him speaking a line, break heart, I prithee break, on which the old Arden editor, Kenneth Muir, had a ridiculous note saying, this line cannot be Lear's because he is already dead. Well, who knows whether he's dead? The quarto text doesn't have him dead then. And who wrote the quarto text? Um, and if, he, if Lear does speak the line, break heart, I prithee break, his death exactly parallels that of Gloucester, which has been described by Edgar, um, some scenes before in which his heart burst smilingly after being reconciled with his child, well, in this case the child lives on, he succumbed willingly to his own death. It, that's another way in which the ending, the horror of the ending, can be ever so slightly mitigated. I've never seen it performed with Lear speaking the line, break heart, I prithee break. The quarter also has more o's and groans yeah. in that speech. But you could argue that the, the fact, you know, of all, of all Shakespeare's about. plays, it's, it's the one where there are most differences between the two published versions, the quarto version published just after the early performance, the folio in Shakespeare's collected works. And as you say, Lear has different dying lines in, in, in each text, and a different person inherits the kingdom at the end of each text. In the quarto, it's the Duke of Albany. In the folio, it's Edgar. Now, you could argue that those differences are signs that uh, this was a a play that Shakespeare and his his acting company had trouble with, that it wasn't quite working and they needed to go back and rework it. We've got to bring in, uh, there's not quite enough time, Nahum Tate, because whatever Lear's force and impact at the time, or near the time, it clearly went out of fashion massively and at the time of the restoration of Charles II came back in a bowdlerized version with a happy ending Cordelia comes back she gets the crown, she marries Edgar the legitimate son of Gloucester Lear limps comfortably with them forever after and it is a happy end. This version was played for something like 150, 160 years 150 years, yeah. Yeah. This was the version of Lear that our ancestors um, wanted to see and, and some of their greatest minds, Samuel Johnson applauded, saying this this was better because it didn't have the horror and the vulgarity of, of the original version which you could Now how do we account for that? Can we it's a big thing to ask you to be brief about Catherine Bosley, but I have no option. I'll do my best. Uh, it, it seems as if half a century after its first production, it had become virtually unintelligible to uh, a, an, a culture that expected poetic justice. So there is no poetic justice in Shakespeare's King Lear. What Nahum Tate does is to restore the fairy tale happy ending. He would have been horrified to know that that's what he was doing. He believed he was introducing probability. He says, I found a heap of jewels, but unstrung and disordered. So I strung them together. And he gives Cordelia a motive for saying nothing, which is that she doesn't want land and a rich husband because she's already in love with Edgar. And probable it is not in our terms. I think that there's a rape scene and Edgar rescues Cordelia from ruffians and most extraordinary things happen. But uh, this poetic justice was what Johnson latched onto. He said, every play is better for poetic justice. I, I, I've never seen any reason against it. It came back as the real play uh, at the time, in the period you 
specialise in particularly, Jonathan Bailey, which is the time of the Romantics. And let's use Keats as an example of that. Why, why, how did his enthusiasm arrive, briskly, and, and, and how did it influence others? Yeah. Above all, from reading the play, because actually when Keats was around in the, the Regency period, 1810 to 1820, old King George III was mad, um, and so the theatre managers did not put King Lear on. It wouldn't do. So Keats couldn't see King Lear. He could only read it. And... He, he, he had a facsimile of the folio and uh, he actually wrote his great sonnet on sitting down to read King Lear once again um, he wrote it in his copy of the play. The play for him was the ultimate example of Shakespeare exploring the dark inner recesses of, of the human spirit and all that kind of strange and passionate language that in the, the rational 18th century people didn't like for the romantics it was really getting back to the thing itself but reading it, not seeing it Catherine Duncan Jones, it swept in, in, let us say, I'm sorry about the generalisation, but in, in the 19th century, Hamlet was the great Shakespeare play. Hamlet would prove that Shakespeare was the genius that he was thought to be then. In the 20th century, more and more became Lear. Now, what's your explanation for that? War, chaos, breakdown of society. Can I actually move into the 21st century yes. and say why I think Lear should be a very, very powerful and frequently performed and considered texts now. Something we haven't mentioned is nature in Lear. There are two themes which I think are absolutely alive and with us today. One is what happens, well, how do we deal with extreme longevity? How do we deal with people in positions of authority who lose their power through old age and people don't really want them around? They may not even want themselves to be around, but there they are still living on the way that James's predecessor, Elizabeth I, lived longer than most of her subjects really wanted her to. The other one is the place of the human race in the natural world, the human race in a world of animals and plants and weather and the interaction of human beings with that world which is constantly referred to and as well as nothing the other thing that runs through the play is questions is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts are human beings actually an aberration in nature are they more cruel than connect than sharks say the sea monster that preys on itself are they are, are they actually the bottom of creation rather than the top constant references to animals and often particularly in the heath scenes a sense there are little dogs on stage rats, mice, I mean they're constantly being referred to by Edgar's poor Tom as if they're actually there alive and Leo in his madness of course it's often as if he's going hunting or he's surrounded by animals, this sense of a world full of non-human nature how do we interact with it? Well, you've just, uh, Catherine Duncan Jones, just given us the cue for a, a second programme of equal length, um, which I hope we can return to. Thank you both. Thank you all three very, very much indeed. Catherine Duncan Jones, Catherine Bellesley, and Jonathan Bate. Next week, Ada Lovelace, daughter of Lord Byron, mathematician. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science, and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.